Today is June 2nd, 2009. We're meeting today with Mr. Frank McDonald at his farm outside of Berthoud, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Frank. And from what I understand from our uh, conversation earlier, you go by Sam, which was your right, uh, was middle, middle name. name. Okay, right. so we'll, we'll play with Sam. Well, thanks for uh, sitting down to tell your story today, and uh, uh, welcome. Okay, Very good. Let's start out, if we could. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. Okay. I uh, was born on December 21st, 24th. 1924. Um, we lived in a little community, uh, a truck farming community called Val Verde on the southwest part of Denver. Uh, and my folks had a little um, farm there. Oh, they grew celery and onions and uh, That's where I was born, and I went to school. I went to three schools in Denver. I went to uh, McKinley Elementary School and Grand Junior High School and South High School. And uh, I had my mother and father, and I had an older sister, a younger brother, and a younger sister. There were four of us kids. and. Uh, I worked, I wasn't uh, too good an athlete, I was a little skinny kid, and I, uh, but I had a lot of jobs and I had an uncle that was uh, a head of all the uh, custodians for the Denver Public Schools. So he got me a job as a sweeper boy. and. Uh, I was a sweeper boy at Grand Junior High School, and when I was a senior in high school, they were having a lot of activities in the evening at the, at the junior high school, and they needed an evening custodian to um, open the school and close it and turn out the lights, and they had a steam boiler. And you, had a bank to fire and a boiler and close up the school and, and it was an eight hour job. It was from four o'clock in the afternoon until midnight. And it was really a great job. I got 50 cents an hour, whereas a sweeper boy I was making a quarter an hour. When did you find so time to I do worked, homework? Yeah. When did you find time to do homework? And I could study. Oh, okay. I could study uh, on the job. I had to be there at four o'clock, and I wasn't really busy all the time. I had to sweep up the gym afterwards or wherever they had a function, and, and uh, mostly my main responsibility was taking care of the boiler. And I, I could do all that at school. The activities ended about ten o'clock at night. And I could do that and be home by midnight. And the, I also caddied out at the Denver Country Club on weekends. And so I spent oh, most of my high school years caddying on the weekends and working for the schools. And uh, um, that's about describes my. And my family was, you know, we had a lot of fun. My dad worked for the Rio Grande Railroad, and he got passes to ride on a train. So we did a lot of things like uh, uh, we'd go over to Palisade in the fall and pick beaches and, and uh, rode the train down practically all over the country. We took trips on a train wow. because we rode around on passes and, and so I was a great I was always grateful to the Rio Grande Railroad for 
buying the groceries and yeah. tra letting me travel around. So right, right. So. Yeah. Which wasn't very common in those days for very right. very seldom did people travel too far away from home. So Right. Yeah. And very I unique. had oh I had another unique thing in our family in this little community of Val Verde. Uh, they uh, it was just like a small community and my mother had an older brother and uh, he married my father's one of my father's sisters huh. and and so my mother was married my mother's name was Mervyn and she was married to a guy named McDonald which is my father and then his sister named McDonald married my mother's brother named Merman. <laughs> Merman was a, 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 my uncle Herb, he lived in Spokane and he was the uh, cattle buyer for Armory Company. And I spent one summer with them up in Spokane. I got a pass and rode the train up to Spokane. And, and uh, several times went I had a cousin the same age as I was, was their oldest son, and so several times we went with him out to ranches to buy cattle and they saddle up horses and we'd ride out and look at these cattle. And that really interested me as I thought I'd like to do that, and uh, so. He had an uncle that was my great uncle, was the vice president of Warmer Company. And one of the reasons he had this good job was because of his uncle it was in Chicago. So anyway, I got, that's what interested me in going to school up at Colorado A&M. When I got out of high school, I started school up there. And uh, then, uh, I don't know what else yeah. I okay. could really say about well, getting me to that point. Well, uh, let me ask you, uh, do you remember where you were and what you were thinking when you heard Pearl Harbor had been bombed? Yeah, it was a, that happened on a Sunday and I was home and I was uh, reading the funny papers when that news came over the radio and uh, You know, it was hard to believe that uh, first place we thought that's funny that the Navy had all those ships bunched up in one place so that the Japs could do that to them. That was a surprise. Yeah. But it was such a dirty trick for them to pull that. You know, they had, uh, one thing I remember, there was a, a shipload of scrap metal in a harbor out in California or some place that was on it was going to go to Japan. They were selling <laughs> scrap metal to Japan. So I'm sure they were making bullets and stuff out of it to shoot back at us. You know? yeah. uh, but that's that. Uh, like I say, I was 16 years old at the time, and I, you know, I didn't have any idea that I'd be in the military service at all. I, yeah. thought, I thought we could blow the Japs off the map and nothing flat, you know. Then they declared war on Germany and Japan. Yeah. And, uh, so after your senior year, you, you enrolled up at A&M uh, in yeah, agriculture. Yeah, I was in the horse-drawn ROTC. They had, they had a, a lot of horses and they had uh, caissons pulled by teams of horses and it was it was fun. We worked with horses, you know. And, and uh, now you said as a state grant university, you had to take that. You were required to take ROTC. Is that correct? Did you? Yeah. Okay. okay. It's a land grant school, and all the land grant schools it was compulsory that you take ROTC for two years. Okay. And then you can voluntarily. Uh, uh, 
I guess you had to join the Army. But, you know, I, I thought I fit in real well with the, uh, with the horse drawn outfit. My grandfather, my mother's folks had a farm as a hygiene. And uh, we used to go see them on a Sunday once in a while. We'd leave real early in the morning to drive from Valverde to Hygiene. Or I guess we'd go on Saturday and we'd stay there Saturday night and come back on Sunday. And it was a real long trip. The car, we'd have flat tires on the car and the radiator boil. We'd have to put water in the radiator. It was, uh, you know, in the 1930s during the Depression. You know, uh, and those were experiences that there were fun experiences for me. In fact, I really enjoyed growing up. We had a yeah. lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. And um, my grandfather uh, worked with horses all the time. He didn't have a tractor. He had two uh, teams of horses. And another thing he did, in his, besides farming, he uh, dug basements. He had a Fresno that the horses pulled, and, and uh, so I was around horses a lot when I was a kid, and so that outfit up in Fort Collins was right up my alley. So as we were talking, uh, you're at ROTC, and there was some change of rules, and and you want to explain how how you eventually got uh, went from ROTC into the regular army and. Go through that that whole uh, story. Well, uh, I had to register for the draft when I was 18, and I so I registered for the draft in Fort Collins, and voluntarily inducted into the army, so I could finish the semester before I had to go if I had to go. That. That was kind of up in the air, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so the ROTC up at they called the school Aggies at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, they had uh, knickers for pants, and uh, what they called them. they weren't boots; they were. There was some kind of thing, I forget what they call uh, it. Like the gator? Up. Yeah. And uh, two things were World War II related in a way with uh, they were having trouble with the beet harvest that fall because a lot of the guys had been gone in the army and, they, uh, and there was a shortage of help. so. Uh, if you if you signed up, you could go work in the beet harvest for a week. And the way they harvested beets at that time was they plowed them loose, and then you went along with a, a beet knife and picked up the beet and cut the top off and threw the beet in one row and left the tops there. And they had a lot of, of uh, Mexican immigrants that worked in the beet harvest. And I worked, the first day I worked, uh, there was a little Mexican lady working alongside of me. And I think I topped a ton of beets in the day, and she topped something like 20 tons. Really? Yeah, she was fantastic. Huh. But. It was a labor-intensive crop at that time. And then they they picked up the beets and put them on a wagon and took them to a beet dump. And uh, they pastured the tops. They put lambs or cattle out on the beet tops. 
Then also the ROTC at Aggies ushered at the National Western Stock Show, and they had the, they had uh, an Aggie ROTC guy and a West High School pep club girl. The West High School pep club girls had black cowboy hats and orange blouses and black skirts. They were the cowgirls. And so I got to go down and spend a week at the stock show. So I had a good time that first year. And the military part didn't bother me at all. Uh -huh. well, I enjoyed that. Good. So then I, I went in the Army. I got notified while I was, I was getting towards the end of the semester that I was to report to Fort Logan on a certain date. Were you able to finish out that semester? Was it what? Were you able to finish out that semester? Yeah, I was okay. able to finish out the okay. semester. Okay, okay. So. And so then I went to Fort Logan and uh, got sent down to Texas for basic training. Did, do you remember that day when you shipped off? Were your folks there to see you off, or? Uh... Uh, no, I was I was only in Fort Logan a week. I I did have an interesting experience there because I had an aunt in Denver that um, played bridge with some ladies. One of the ladies' husband was the commanding officer out of Fort Logan. And she told this lady that she had a nephew out of Fort Logan. And she said, well, I'll tell my husband, maybe he, maybe he could uh, get to come home. They usually don't let any of those guys out of there. Mm. But, uh, so my aunt says, oh good, he, I know he'd like to do that. Well. I, there were several guys I had gone to high school with that were getting drafted at the same time. And, w and there was one guy there who had been in the Navy Air Corps, and he landed a plane on a highway by a drive-in movie. For some unexplained reason. Anyhow, they kicked him out of the Navy Air Corps. And drafted him into the army. Huh. But he knew a little bit about the way the the outfit worked and he he would come out in the morning and he'd call off several of us call off our names for a detail and march us out. There was a, a, a big huge lumber pile not too far from where the barracks were and he'd march us we'd have a magazine or a newspaper or something. He'd march us out there and we didn't have to serve on any of the other details that they called. And that was out there when the officer, commanding officer, wanted to see me to let me go home for the day. <laughs> they couldn't find me. And that caused a big rhubarb, you know, we came back in at night and they're calling out my name, you know, and I said, here I am. Well, right away they sent me in to see this officer. He said, we've been looking for you all day. Where were you? Nobody knew where you were. Well, I was over a barrel, you know. Yeah. Yeah, they right. couldn't snitch on the guy that led us out there. I said, well, I was there. I just never heard my name called. He said, well, that, that's your problem because you could have gone home. Oh. You can't. You're going to leave tomorrow. I'll be done. So, but that was, uh, I thought, boy, I gotta, you know, I'm gonna have trouble in the army if I have any more deals like that. <laughs> oh. so, so the next day you shipped off and you said to Texas day, for yeah, uh, And that was in, that was in April. And here in this 
area, we still had our winter uniforms on. And uh, we got on the train and they took us down to the Mineral Wells, Texas. I thought, I'd ridden the train several times before, and I thought maybe there was a steam pipe broken or something was so hot in the car. And uh, we got off the train and it was just as hot outside as it was inside. And it was really hot down there in Texas. But they had a really good program. We, um, by the time I finished basic training, I, I was in such good physical shape, I felt like I could whip anybody in the world. Uh, <laughs> I was really, they really did a good job. Now, you said that uh, while in college in ROTC, that the military part of it really didn't bother you. How was it, now that you're in the regular and went through basic, how was that transition into, into the... I, you know, it was, uh, it was such a good, they had such good personnel down there. And uh, they got us in good physical shape. I didn't, I, uh, um, you know, we had to work all the time. They kept us busy. We'd get up in daylight, you know, and go to bed. When it got dark, hmm. and we were doing stuff, all, you know, we were learning how to fire rifles and hiking and uh, doing KP and all that stuff. It, I, I don't have any bad memories at all about basic yeah. training. Yeah, good. So then, where did you go then from basic? Where and then from basic training? went to Philadelphia to the Drexel Institute of Technology in this ASTP program. Now was that and something you had to test for or how did how did you yeah, get into they, that program? How did they, they choose? They they uh, uh, gave us examinations in basic training and, uh, and it helped me that I'd been in school for a year because I knew a little bit about taking tests and stuff. So they notified me that I was eligible to go to the ASTP. Which program. you said was an engineering program? Yeah. Okay. And uh, so also at the time, they started the 10th Mountain Division and they built Camp Hale up by Leadville there. Uh, and there were, it was going to be a ski trooper thing. So I wrote while I was going to Drexel, I thought, you know, I think I'd rather than go to college, I'd rather be in the ski troops. So I, I wrote and I got a card back from them that uh, uh, since I was in the ASTP program, there was a question about the uh, continuation of that program, and until that was determined, uh, I'd have to wait, and then I could find out if I could maybe get in the ski troops. It was a real nice letter that mm -hmm. you guys were. I, and of course, then when they canceled the ASTP and sent us all to different infantry outfits. Uh, I couldn't, I lost my chance to try to get in the ski troops. And uh, so the ESTP, you know, they, there are a lot of really good men uh, that were in the ESTP. Uh, it's just a shame how many of those guys got killed, mm. you know. Uh, really, 18 and 19 year olds were probably, I'm sure when looking back on it, the Army thought those are the guys that can, that, that can withstand all the physical stress and everything that uh, 
for frontline riflemen, you know, um, any frontline combat troops, because, like, once we got in into combat, we couldn't. There was no facilities, for instance, to take a bath, and they would, uh, we would, uh, when we'd go back to a rest area, we'd take all our clothes off and, and they'd spray us with DDT. Jeez. That was our bath. That would keep, supposedly keep, kill the bugs and stuff. And they'd give us clean clothes. And, uh, well, let's back up. We'll, we'll get into these stories. Let's back up. Uh, uh, after the, uh, the program was disbanded, then you were sent into the infantry. Where did you go from Philadelphia then? Uh, we went to... Uh, Camp Claiborne, Louisiana. Now, did the whole college go together, or were they disbanded throughout? Uh, did you guys pretty much go as a group, or? Most of the guys from Drexel went to the 84th Division. Okay. And the, the I, I can't remember the college that Bill Ingram, the guy that got captured in Company K, he, he came from a college in western Pennsylvania somewhere. Oh, okay. So there That's were a lot of... ASTPs, and it was kind of, um, I think it explains, I think Larry Moses has in his book where the regular army guys in, that were in the 84th Division, uh, uh, all the non-coms and um, most of the uh, other guys that hadn't been in ASTP, kind of, there were kind of two different groups of guys. They, the regular guys kind of resented in a way that they got all these college boys all of a sudden, you know, until that leveled out after a while. But that, that, that was one of the problems at the start of that, when we first went to the 84th Division. And the Army at that time was still segregated. They, uh, all the blacks in the army were in black outfits. They had white officers, but they had a black outfit of some kind there at Camp Claiborne. Uh, but there again, they kept us real busy because they were getting ready to, uh, you know, we were taking tropical type training. We. So did you have kind of the impression you were heading to the Pacific then? Yeah. Uh, they, uh, we uh, sleep out when we were, we were spent a lot of time out in the field. And, and had mosquito nets and water rationing, training, and, and uh, Louisiana was something else. They had storms down there and we'd be sleeping out. We'd have to, it would rain so hard. We had, uh, we had to prop our head up on, on somehow to keep our head up out of the water. So if we were sleeping, we wouldn't drown lying there. Uh, it was really an experience down there in Louisiana. And then they, uh, they sent us to Camp Kilmer, New Jersey from Louisiana, and that's where we got on the ship to go. We went to England. We thought we were going to the it's South Pacific because yeah. we've been doing all this tropical right, right. stuff, you know. Uh, and then the rumor was that we were going to be the Army of Occupation. We'd go to England, and when the war was over, we'd be the Army of Occupation. Well, let me, let that me didn't pan out because they took they 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 had gone from Omaha Beach through France. By okay, the time so we, okay. By the time we went across the we went across the English Channel in a British ship, and got off on those assault boats that went in because they didn't have a dock or anything in Omaha Beach then, and then we had a wade in. Uh, from the uh, assault boats into shore, and then we we 
hiked for about three days. How soon after D-Day was this that you guys landed in France? This was uh, in uh, this was in October. Okay. And D-Day was in June. Right. Well, let me back up too. I, I want to ask you. Uh, uh, here's a guy that grew up in Landlock, Colorado. You, you get on the ship uh, to cross the the Atlantic. How how was that crossing? Did you get your sea legs? How did that work? Uh, what was that? That was an amazing thing because we were on this. Uh, oh, I'm I'm sure our whole regiment was. I don't think the whole division was on the same ship, but it was a. It had been a cruise ship that had been converted to a troop carrier, and the bunks on that ship were in the hold five high. There were five guys, and guys would get the guys that got seasick were usually in four and five. They'd throw up. And if you were in three, two, or one, but I spent most, it took about 12 days for us to cross the Atlantic in a huge convoy. And the, the Queen Mary was a, was a big cruise ship at that time that the Army had taken over and they painted it all gray. And the Navy looked like a Navy ship, but it was, it was a ship next to us. Uh, and the convoy ship, there were a lot of Navy ships, and they would change directions all the time. Because of the uh, U-boats? It, was, a, it was in September, and it was nice weather, and uh, I spent most of the time, I never did get seasick. No. No. Uh, we f got fed twice a day, and they had a... Uh, uh, a mess hall thing where you'd go through a, a buffet like line with a tray and you'd come stand at a at a counter there'd be a row of guys that, and uh, the ship sometimes would tip a little that's another thing if somebody gets sick they'd heave on their tray the ship would tip and the tray would come down <laughs> and, that was, and uh, I spent most of my time, even at night, I stayed out on the deck. I, you didn't have to go down and sleep in those bunks. I tried that. I always seemed that, that I got in one, two, or three. <laughs> <laughs> Guys above me got sick. But uh, oh, that was a, you know, a real experience going over there. I bet. Was there any worries about U-boats at the time? Did you ever yeah, concern they, yourself they, about that? Well, they never did. We never had any problem that way at all. Yeah. Not, nobody ever threatened that convoy at all. That must have been a sight there to see. There were still U-boats around because after we had gone across the English Channel, and, and I was, I was going to say after we hiked for about three days, then they, they had trucks that picked us up and took us in to uh, uh, close to the German border. I mean, we were either now, now, did you go directly from the States to, to France or did you go to England first or how, how was your route? We went to England first and okay. we were in England about a month. And uh, we were in a camouflaged kind of a camp they had. They couldn't tell that there was bunch of soldiers there because they had well, uh, you know they didn't have anything that looked like a bunch of barracks okay and stuff. okay and uh, we did I got to go to London one time on a pass while we were in England and uh, Like I say, we were there about a month, and then they took us across the English Channel. And, uh, after we had crossed the English Channel, uh, the U-boat sunk a troop ship going across the English Channel. Hmm. I think that most of the guys got saved, 
Right. But they had a, they had a, you know, evacuate that ship because they poked a hole in it. So there were still German U-boats around at that point in the war. And uh, that was kind of the build up until we got into combat. Okay, so you guys landed at Normandy, and then you said you hiked for three days, and then and then we're and then picked up by trucks. trucks. And then our first uh, our first uh, entry into combat was in November, and uh, that first day we were our job was to capture this pillbox, or not necessarily capture it, but to get around behind it so that we cut off the supply to the pillbox. Mm -hmm. And there was rainy and cold, and we had a lot of casualties. In fact, in a, in a, in a rifle company, there's a, a, a platoon has three squads. Each squad has 12 guys in it. They have a squad leader who is a staff sergeant, and then they have an assistant squad leader who is a buck sergeant, and they have 10 riflemen in there. And one of the guys in each squad had a Browning automatic rifle, it was a BAR man, and that's a real heavy mm -hmm. rifle. I happen to be the BAR man in our squad, and I luckily had a shovel on my pack, and not everybody had a shovel, there were some had an axe, and my, I don't remember what else, I remember axe and a shovel, but I was one of the lucky ones because the first day we went in, in the combat, we'd go a little ways and then hit the ground and have to dig a slip trench, you know. They were, uh, uh, and uh, at the end of that day, there was three of us left in our squad. Uh, we were all PFCs. And they, uh, we went back to a rest area and the lieutenant was organizing our Lieutenant leader was a second lieutenant. He was counting everybody, getting everything organized, and he told the three of us, he said, okay, you guys, one of you is going to decide who's going to be the squad leader, who's going to be the assistant squad leader, and who's going to stay the PFC, because we were all three of three us PFC. And so we matched coins somewhere or other. And one guy got to be the squad leader, so he was promoted right away to a staff sergeant. I, I got to be the assistant squad leader, and this other guy stayed the PFC. <laughs> then uh, we got replacements. So out of that 12-man squad, you're the only three of you left. The others have been well, injured or killed. Three. Of the rest, and I, I'm not. I don't know for sure if they. If they all were, the others were all killed, but uh, we were the only three that got back off that wow. thing. And some of them, of course, had been wounded and carried off and everything. Uh, so we had uh, uh, we kept that squad. The three of us stayed in that squad. We kept getting replacements all the time, but we, we kept the same squad leader and assistant squad leader and until after the Battle of the Oh, then uh, we, we had a couple of other assignments there at the Siegfried Line, that's where the pillboxes were and stuff. Uh, and they took us, one day, they, they took us uh, 
back to a rest area. They loaded us on the trucks. And they, uh, by the time we got loaded on the trucks, it was starting to get dark. And the trucks traveled a little ways. And pretty soon they, they turned their lights on. And we thought, boy, I wonder what's going on because uh, we, we, we got to be getting away from the Siegfried line if they're turning the lights on. We ended up in a town called Marche, Belgium, and um, we got off the trucks and went to, to sleep in a schoolhouse, and the school had, they'd had school there that day because there was writing on the blackboard and all the chairs in the rooms that we had to shove off to the side, and that was the beginning of the Battle of the Bulge, the Germans had broken through the line and were coming in through Belgium. And of course, we didn't know what was going on, but they took us down there and they, they had, uh, the Germans had guys that spoke English, had American Army uniforms on, they even had MP bands on their arms. And some of the trucks that came, the Germans sent them down the road and captured the guys. Wow. Uh. You know, that's how, the, that German bulge offensive was something else. Well, the next morning, they, they took our platoon, our company, they gave a line to set up a, a defense there. And our platoon got up on the top of a hill. And there was another platoon. There were, there were three rifle platoons and a weapons platoon. So there was another platoon on the left side of the hill and another on that. We were on top. And the Germans then, uh, we were there for a day and the uh, they brought us, the, uh, the kitchen crew came with the jeep and a trailer and brought us some food. And while they were unloading the food, the Germans started shelling where we were with mortar shells. So the, the kitchen crew they had a couple boxes of D-bars or these chocolate bars. And they threw the D-bars off and took off. And, uh, the Germans then went through these, they, they wiped out this whole platoon that was on the left of us in our company. And these other guys got scattered somehow or other, but the Germans went past us and they, the next day was the day after Christmas, they, uh, a tank came up the hill. Um, uh, the south side of the hill that we were on. And there were three of us uh, digging a hole. The lieutenant wanted us to have a hole out in the middle of this field that we could be in at night and see anything that might happen on the field. Because he didn't know what we, you know, we lost all communications with the company commander and everything. Uh -huh. And I was sitting, we had the hole, you know, there was three of us digging this hole, it was a pretty big hole. And I was sitting up on the bank and I saw over on the edge, the ground start churning up because there was a, this tank had a machine gun and they pointed it at us. But the guy had the barrel of the machine gun down into the dirt and I, I I just was lucky I happened to see that dirt kicking up before you could even hear the machine gun. Hmm. So I rolled down on, in the top of these two guys that were in the hole. And I thought one of their shovels was digging in my leg. And uh, they just splattered all of the hole 
They dug up, plowed up the dirt with bullets all the way around the top of us. Didn't, didn't get us. Nor did they come across the field. But what was, what I thought was a shovel was digging in my leg is that, that I'd been shot in the leg. I'll be done. And uh, uh, we laid there, we thought for sure they were going to come up to that, that tank and they'd stick the barrel of the gun, blow us out of the hole, you know. They didn't, the tank didn't come across there. And so then we were there about you know, seven or eight days. It tells in that book some, I'm sure how. Uh, well, we had a, a medical aid man with us in our platoon and he put sulfur powder and stuff on my leg and bandaged it up. How badly injured were you? No, I wasn't badly injured at all. Oh. I had, and, uh, except I had a bullet hole in me, <laughs> and so uh, they, uh, we, while we were there, we took about five German prisoners, guys that were wandering around, got lost from their outfit and stuff, because the Germans had gone past us, further north from us. and. One night, uh, they shot down a, a German plane and the pilot bailed out. And he came down landed in this field where we had that hole with his parachute. And what we did with those guys, we, we had them lie on their stomach at night with their arms spread out. And so we made sure they weren't going to move around or pull anything funny on us. And we, we were about, we didn't have anything to eat. We ate all those D-bars right away. And we, we could build fires during the daytime and we'd take bark off of trees and stuff and put in our mess kits and try to make soup with with some of the vegetation around there because we didn't have anything we had stuff to drink we because it snowed but uh, then they had a big counter offensive the and the second armored division of the allied troops came through there chased the germans back and uh that's when we got rescued we had we waved white flags for the yeah. <laughs> you know and they uh, then we were in the rest area and got they reorganized the division there because this one whole platoon that got they killed the whole platoon wow and they uh, then they started to counter-offensive, but then it started snowing, and we spent about three weeks in January there, but the Germans had kind of given up then. And from what I understand, that period of time, wasn't that one of the, the coldest winters that Europe had ever experienced? No, uh, it was a terrible winter, yeah. yeah. It was terrible, and we had guys, I, I personally, Every chance I got, I took off my boots and our, our feet got wet. And I'd wring out my socks and because the guys were getting trench foot. And if you didn't do that every chance you got, you were subject to getting trench foot. And I didn't want to get trench foot. so. But even then, it was, it was kind of hopeless because you didn't know whether you were going to live for another half hour anyway. Wow. In Let fact, me... we had one guy uh, just left his bare feet outside of his sleeping bag one night and froze his feet. And he, of course, he got hauled back. 
I, I'm sure they had an amputated his mm. feet. I never did sure, ever hear what happened to that guy. Did, did, were you properly clothed for that for those conditions? I heard that you know, a lot of units didn't have the proper clothing. How how were you as far as your unit as far as clothing? Well, we, we, you know, we had the uniforms and we had um, we had boots that had rubber bottoms on them, but they st your feet still got wet, and uh, I. That was one thing I was religious about was keeping my feet. Uh, and of course, it felt better. And was something I could rub my feet and wring my socks out and put them back on again. And, uh, and a lot of guys did that. Mm. The three of us that were in that were survivors of that first day, we we all all three of us did that all the time. And. Uh, the rest of the guys in our squad all the time were replacements. Uh, some of them stayed with us the whole rest of the war. But some of them did, but they, they had. Uh, uh, after we got through, we we had a couple of uh, attacks we were on. After we got rescued from that, being surrounded there, and then uh, uh, one interesting thing happened. I was one of the guys in our squad, and I was the assistant squad leader then. And one of my jobs was to make sure. That every, I was the follow-up guy, and make sure that nobody turned around to run back. Oh, one of my jobs was to keep everybody going, following. The squad leader had to leave. Everybody had to follow him, and I'd make sure that everybody followed him, and did what the squad, whatever the squad leader wanted. And this one guy told me, he says, like, he says, like, I can't. Uh, he says, I, I can't go because I know I'm going to get it. Somehow or other, I got the word from upstairs or something yeah. that I can't go. So, and he, he really seemed sincere to me. He wasn't scared or anything, but he says, uh, so we, I said, well, in a little bit, we were crossing trick there. I said, why don't you just trip and fall down and I'll send you back. That's the way you feel because you're not going to do us any good anyway. So he did. Well, we sent him back. So he survived that particular thing we were on. And later on, uh, about a month later, We were back in Germany again there, and we were on a, some, we were filling our canteens with water and we were spread out going to where the Lister bag was. And a uh, mortar shell fell, almost a direct hit on that guy. Is that right? Uh. So whatever feeling he had that he was going to get it in Belgium, he ended up getting it anyway, which is, you know, things like that happen make you make you wonder what what's going on in the world, you yeah. know. Well that, let's let's talk about you personally. How did how did you deal with that as far as uh, the fear and, and and can you talk about oh, what it's like to be in, in battle for I mean I have and probably many that will view this have no idea what it's like to be in battle. How you how you function in something like that? What uh, what's going through your mind and what are you thinking? So scared. And uh, uh, you kind of felt like, well, you know, if I'm going to get it, I hope I get it right between the eyes so I don't know what's happening. There was, the, they, they call it, 
million dollar wounds and ten thousand dollar wounds. The ten thousand dollar wounds were that's what your life insurance was. Your folks got the ten thousand. A million dollar wound is you'd get a little nick somewhere and get sent back to a hospital and they'd send you back to the United States or something. But a, a really uh, you're just scared all the time. But there's some kind of adrenaline occurs that, uh, you know, that you think, well, I can do this. I was, one night we were walking down this road and there was shells going off on send out blasts of light you know, and there was some guys, oh, I was on the road, and there was another guy in our squad that was down here, and there were, here comes some Germans walking towards us, and this guy down here could see by the, the helmet, German helmet, you know, and this German was walking when he had a burp gun like this, and he was walking right towards me, and this guy down here shot him. And the other guys behind him, when he got shot, they stuck up their hands. And had this guy not been here, you know, he did Cut you in half. Let right? me have it. Yeah. Have it. So I, you, things like that happen, you wonder, why, why did that happen? How yeah, did I yeah. miss that, you know? Because, uh, um, and I, uh, somehow or other, uh, lived through all that. You'd wonder. One thing about, uh, they gave us cigarettes. I didn't smoke until I was overseas there. At the end of the chow line, when we'd be back at the rest area, they'd have a 30-gallon tank, a can full of all different kinds of cigarettes. You could take as many as you wanted. And most of us had, we had those cartridge belts on, and we'd uh, replace a cartridge of ammunition with a pack of cigarettes. And, We'd smoke, like we'd be sitting in a foxhole, a couple of us, and one guy would smoke a cigarette, and when it got way down, he'd fire up the next guy's cigarette. And we'd, we'd sit there maybe for six hours smoking. We'd smoke one cigarette while the other guy was resting and then light up his cigarette. And it was, you know, I don't know how I lived through all that because, like, didn't brush our, we never could well, brush our teeth. That's another question I got to ask, too, is how, how do you think you physically managed through that time? I mean, you were, obviously weren't eating probably very well. Sleeping conditions had to be awful. The weather conditions were awful. The hygiene was awful. How did, I, physically, how did you I know. make physically, it? Physically, you know, we would sit there and shake for hours at a time. That's what I say. You had we we figured we we figured uh, we call ourselves cannon fodder because we were eighteen and nineteen years old. You know that would was well, it's, it's hard to explain how you could how you could live through that like dusting you off with DDT, yeah. giving you clean clothes and and uh, an, another thing. Uh, that if you were lying down there, pinned down, you had a poop, you poop. Then you had to roll over and smash it all down and just thin as you could so it would dry out. And that, that, that's kind of, those are the kind of physical things that's just unbelievable, you wow. know. How often would you get pulled off the front line to go back for a rest in R&R? &R? Well, it was, it was pretty often they would do that. I mean, they, the 
uh, sometimes we would uh, be in those, we'd hit, dig a foxhole and we'd be there for maybe two days or something like that. The squad leader w uh, would have to get um, the K rations or the C rations or whatever and make sure and, and find out where we could get water and everything. That was one of the squad leader's responsibilities. And after we after we got out of the bulge, he took we went to Holland and we were gonna be the assault outfit across the Roar River. So we had to take riverboat training and they had these boats that had flat bottoms on them and they had they held twelve guys. And so we stayed in Dutch homes during the daytime. And at nighttime they took us out to this river to practice with these boats. And uh, we stayed in a house of a Dutch coal miner and his wife, and they had a 16-year-old son that uh, uh, spoke English. And, uh, they, they were happy to have our squad in their house because they brought food in to us at night and we gave them all the food they wanted. That coal miner guy, we'd come in with the muddy boots and wet clothes and all that stuff from practicing getting out into the river before he went to work in the coal mine. They were still, the kid was still going to school hmm. and uh, uh, he cleaned off all our boots and stuff before. We, we'd come in there about three or four o'clock in the morning and then go in and go to sleep and we stayed in the house all day. So, uh, I, uh, I, when I got home, I kept corresponding with that couple. They couldn't speak English or write English or anything, but their son uh -huh. answered for me. And he kept, they, they eventually died, but he, we sent each other a Christmas card every Christmas. And then in 1994, they came over here to Bertha to see us. I'll be they were, they were here for three weeks, he and his wife. And we had a really good time with them. Uh -huh. And one of our neighbors to have a dairy over here, uh, Brad Pickard's his name, and he, his wife's name is Deanie, and she was from Holland. She spoke Dutch, so she could talk to his wife, but Leo, the guy's name was Leo. He spoke German and French, and he, you know he was real. Um, so anyway, that was a, a neat experience I got from that deal of the yeah. railroad training. Yeah. When we, when we, the morning we crossed the Ruhr River, we got to the where we we're going to cross about uh, one o'clock in the morning, and. The, they shelled and bombed the, the German side of the river for four or five hours. It was just something else. Huh. And then we, we went across the river. Our squad leader was one of the, the three of us. He's the first guy out of the boat. He starts running up the bank and he got shot, killed him. The rest of us scattered around, you know, but then that meant that I was the squad leader and our PFC buddy was the assistant squad leader. Uh. And that happened there at the crossing of the Roar River. And so then he and I both were two of the 13 guys that we, we were still there at the end of the war. You were saying earlier, out of what, 184 people that left uh, the camp in Louisiana, there was 13 of you left. 13 of us that, that had been there all the time. Some of them had been wounded or had gotten sick and had 
went back, recuperated? Had left and came back again. Okay. So uh, it was only the, there was only the 13 of us that had been there all the time. Wow. And my leg had, you know, uh, I didn't have to go to the hospital or anything. Were you awarded the Purple Heart for that? And I got a Purple okay. Heart. Okay, yeah. okay, good. And I, I always did, you know, haven't bragged too much about the Purple Heart, but I'm gonna let the cat in. Yeah. Uh, so, because I know one guy, uh, He's still alive. Uh, his name is Raul Garcia. He lives in Modesto, California. And I met him at, uh, he was in Company I. And Larry Moses had gone to see him and talked to him. But he had gone, gone away from the, uh, he wasn't in the 13, but he, uh, uh, because he'd been out of the unit for a while, or maybe some of the major battles we were in or something, been assigned to something else. And so he wasn't one of the 13, but he was there at Camp Claiborne. And uh, he was uh, there at VE Day, but he had not been Totally with the, oh, right, the whole right, time. Right. So where did you guys from the Ruhr River then uh, continue your story okay, from there? The Ruhr River, then we went to a, a, a little town. And see, I hadn't been a squad leader for too long then because this was right after we crossed the Ruhr River. And uh, so I took two guys left the rest of our squad and the assistant squad leader in a building at one end of this little town. And I took two guys and we went down to the other end and there, weren't, we, there were no Germans there at all. And we were in this house uh, and it got dark. We decided to spend the night there. and. Uh, here came on the way the Germans were defending this area here. They, they were, uh, they had a couple tanks and a, a bunch of little cars and a bunch of guys walking. Here comes this whole bunch of Germans into the town and we were in this, we were down where there weren't, we were the only three <laughs> there the rest of the outfit was up at the other end of town. And we're, we're sitting there, the town was deserted and the windows were blowing out and everything. But here were these Germans and they were, uh, they were out in the street in front of this house. You know, it was unbelievable. There were, there must have been a hundred of them couple things. Uh, we didn't know what to do with, you know, we we could shoot maybe two or three of them. Yeah. But <laughs> that was, it was really amazing. We didn't do anything. And we just froze in there. And we thought, what are we going to do when they come in here, you know? We're going to surrender? Or we're going to shoot one for one, or what do we do? They, they went on through town, and they, the guys on the other end of town, they shot at them. And so that scattered them around, and they left town, but they, they shot back a couple of cannons and mortars and stuff. And so we lost guys up at the other end of the mm -hmm. town. Not, we lost three or four in our squad that were there. And the, the three of us, you know, the next day we all got assembled again. But it's weird experiences like that that, you know, I could have reached out and touched one of those guys. Wow. Uh. 
and on. But anyway, then we went across uh, first uh, we were in a convoy all loaded on trucks and we saw our first jet airplane. A German jet flew down and started strafing the convoy and our driver went off in, into a field. And that, was, that was a scary thing because when one of those jet airplanes, nobody had ever seen anything right, like right, that right. before. It made a terrible bang when it went over, you know. And they didn't do too much damage and that, that was just a real quick thing that they did. That was another thing that was that happened every night. The Germans had these, we call them bedtime charlies. They had these missiles that were, they were sending over to bomb on England, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. Every night we'd hear those motor bombs going across the sky. Wow. Yeah. It, even, even though though in, the, in, in Belgium during the bulge, there were a couple of days when there was a clear blue sky from border to border, and the whole sky would be full of airplanes flying over to bomb Germany. That must have been a sight. A, a, a unbelievable sight. All the bombers and fighter planes and everything that, wow. you know, covered the whole sky. All, I don't know how many, what, no way you could count how many planes, which is, a tremendous, tremendous display of force. Wow. And uh, we went to the town of the big city of Hanover, Germany. We were the first outfit to go into Hanover. And we came in through the west side of town where there was a huge railroad yard. And in that railroad yard, there were, they'd been bombed. There were railroad tracks sticking three or four stories up in the air. And uh, one section of the railroad yard, there were lined up. There were no damage to the tracks. Every track had a whole bunch of tank cars. They were all standard oil company huh. cars. So somehow or other, they uh, had arranged to get their cars put in this railroad yard on a certain thing and taken off the bomb targets of the U.S. Air Force. Uh, so somehow or other, some big shot yeah, in the yeah. Standard Oil Company talked them into not bomb. They said, we'll get all these cars there and you don't, don't bomb that part. Huh. So, how did you uh, how did you find? Uh, and there was that that was fully populated town. They, we walked down the streets and there were German civilians on both sides, like they were watching a parade. How were they? How were they interacting with you? How were they treating you? Or they was were, there any? They, they were, you know, they were just standing there watching us. And uh, we went to one little area of the town. They didn't leave us in there very long because. Uh, uh, we, we went in the houses and the people got out of the houses and then we slept in the houses. And the, the civilians were just, they just took off and disappeared. Uh, but they, they had other troops come in there after us. They got us out of there pretty fast because uh, they didn't want us going in their houses and stuff. And what wasn't much they could do to us to stop us anyway. So we weren't in this, in the big city very long, but then we went to the Elbe River and Roosevelt and Churchill and Stalin had had a conference, they called the Yalta Conference, North Africa somewhere. Mm -hmm. And they decided that the Russians would come to the Elbe and the Allied forces would meet at the Elbe. And at that particular time, everybody in the Allied forces wanted to go to 
go to Berlin because most most little hometowns and stuff had prizes for the first American soldier to get to Berlin. <laughs> and then they wouldn't let us, you know, they stopped us at the Alp River. But the Germans were trying to get away from the Russians and so they we took oh, in about three days there our company had about three thousand German prisoners. Uh -huh. And some of them were women who had shaved off all their hair and had German army uniforms on. And uh, when the Russians got there, they wanted uh, all the prisoners. They were their prisoners. They chased them down. So you had actually linked up with the Russians then? Yeah. Oh, wow. So, yeah. And so they, our, our officers said, okay, you, we don't want the prisoners. You can have the prisoners. But we. We let some the women and some of the young guys that could speak English and stuff, we let them make a break for it. We, we didn't try to stop them from getting away. Yeah. And probably should have made them all go back. But uh, at that point, we'd been there about two weeks on the Elk River. And our our outfit stayed at a, a big farm where they had horses and buggies and stuff so we we got to play around with the horses and the buggies and did you ever interact at all with the russians did you ever had a chance to no no okay just the army the army officers with uh, i had one there was one German officer that uh, came over and, and was uh, one of the prisoners we took, and I took a pistol off of him. And I, he was an SS officer. Right. And I took the insignia off his uniform. He could speak English. I said, you know, they were surrendering. He gave me the pistol. Mm -hmm. He didn't try to shoot me or anything. Yeah. And so then VE Day came and I came home. Remember when uh, VE Day was announced? Do you remember where you were and what you were thinking? You know, I, I survived this thing and. Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, they, you know, that was, that was another thing. They had uh, captured distilleries and uh, liquor distributors yeah. and everything. Uh -huh. So they had a lot of liquor and they passed it all out VE day. You could have anything you wanted to drink. So. Most of us drank, got sick. <laughs> <laughs> Must have been a great, but a great was, feeling was, and a great celebration. Really, a, really a, a celebration, you sure. know. The, After what you'd all been through, the war was over. Yeah. And uh, we had, that, that was after, of course, the V Day was after we'd taken all those prisoners and mm -hmm. given them back to the Russians and never, you know, that was. And, that was in the springtime, it was pretty nice, that was, that was a good feeling. So uh, after that was announced then, did your unit stay on as occupation force or where did you move from yeah. there, where did you go well, from that, there? That, yeah, that, oh, I, was, I was there for uh, oh, six, six weeks after VE day because I was number six to come home. Yeah, tell that story. We talked about it off camera. How that uh, how that all transpired, the the story uh, of the thirteen. Yeah. Well, the thirteen of us uh, that were eligible for the uh, high casualty outfit trip back to the uh, to the states. One 
And that policy was, as you said, Eisenhower said with the high casualty units, one person one, per week could come home. soldier a week could come back. And they, well, they sent us to a, a, they call it Camp Lucky Strike. It was uh, um, on the uh, yeah. English Channel where mm -hmm. they had a, In France? a place where they could load you on a ship. And uh, so uh, I was number seven when we cut cards. I was the two numbers, the week number seven. The first sergeant was week number six. The week number six, they froze the, f or week number five, they froze the f first sergeant. So I moved up to number six and went to Camp Lucky Strike and uh, they canceled the heavy casualty survivor program there because they had all the prisoners of war and the wounded and stuff that they were selling, sending back. And but you still made the cut though? They canceled it right after you made the cut, yeah, right? Okay. Was the, I was the last one that got to go. The rest of, them, the rest of the guys had to stay there, including my buddy that was the, was the assistant squad leader, he, he stayed with them. And then I never did see him after that because he came back and we, you know, everybody started over. Sure, again. you bet. And then after yeah. the war, and we, since he lived in Pennsylvania and I never had a chance to get back there, he never had a chance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, never got to see him again, so that, that was, Twice been disappointed in that. Sure. And, uh, um, then, um, when I, I I ended up being in the assigned to the Infantry Basic Training Center at Camp Robinson, Arkansas. So it was kind of That's kind of funny I mean. how you were saying how uh, you thought you were lucky to make that cut, but while you were. At, in, yeah. in Arkansas, tell us about what, what the rest of your unit was doing. Yeah, well, while I was uh, back in the Spit and Polish Army, uh, training new recruits, and that was an experience in itself for me because I had become a staff sergeant, but not because of my going to a corporal and right. thing and training guys, giving commands and uh, you know, directing guys in close order drill and that kind of stuff. Mine was a whole different deal. But uh, that's what I was doing. All my buddies in the 84th were touring Europe. <laughs> <laughs> they, you know, because the war in Japan, they only last, they, July and August, they were sweating it out going over to South Pacific. So yeah, so initially you thought you were lucky because if, uh, there was yeah. a chance that you guys were gonna get transferred to the I South could, Pacific. I figured, yeah. you know, if I ever got back to the United States, I was never leaving again. They would, yeah. you know, uh, I'd desert the army before I go overseas again. <laughs> so uh, that, but then I, that's where I got discharged was at Camp Province in Arkansas. And that was December of 45? In December yeah. of 40, December 5th of 1945, I got, I got discharged. Now, now he Some of the guys, now this, my, my buddy that was the assistant squatter, your name is John Defford. John, they, he stayed over there with the outfit. They came back in, in 1946, early part of 1946. Before he got discharged, so I was lucky because I was back here and uh, I had enough points to get out. Now that whole time, from the time uh, you left Fort Logan till you got discharged, uh, you'd missed that one chance to get home. Had you been home at all between that period of time? Had you had a chance, any sort of leaves to get home at all in that period of time? Yeah. Well, when, right when I when I. Uh, um, when I came back 
from oh, okay. Camp, uh, Camp Lucky Strike, I got on a, on a uh, Liberty ship. And how was that crossing? Uh, Liberty back? ships were ships that were built real fast to, to uh, haul food and troops and stuff. Right. And at, uh, most of the passengers on there were prisoners of war or wounded. And we were started out in a convoy across the North Atlantic, and uh, the uh, not soon after we started in that convoy, they canceled all the convoys. Every ship could go on its own. There wasn't any threat anymore mm -hmm. from. Okay. Uh, but that was before the war was over with Japan. But the still the Atlantic Ocean, they figured there wasn't any problem. Right, okay. So then we got in a storm in the North Atlantic. And uh, uh, we were on that Liberty ship. I, I suppose the hazard of us not making it through that storm was worse than, or just as bad as anything we've been wow. in the rest because they had, I, and I, I don't know how, I could determine this for sure, but they supposedly we were in a storm where they had 70 foot waves. Well, 70 foot wave is seven stories high, but they were huge. So when we'd be at the top of the of the wave, the bow of the ship and the propeller were out of the water. water. That's how. And that, Liberty ships were pretty big ships. And then you'd go way down and there'd be water way up there, you know. Uh, uh. And, you, you know, I didn't get seasick either time. I'll be darned. Yeah. Uh. So, uh, it was really something to come back in New York. We came back in New York Harbor and Not everybody statue. ran to one side of the ship and the ship was tipped up like this. They had, they kept announcing, to, get spread out, don't get off that side of the ship. But there were boats out there with bands on them, you know, and, and waving flags uh, and everything for every troop ship that came in. With a, see the Statue of Liberty yeah. there? That was, oh, that, wow. that was real. Wow. And then to get on the train to come home, to come back to Denver, nothing, there, all the roofs were on all the houses, all the chimneys, all the streets, nothing, nothing torn up at all, you know, like it was in Europe. Yeah, so right. Just blown to pieces over there. Uh, and you'd see a, a sewer pipe up a couple stories high with a toilet on it, you know, <laughs> that'd be the only thing sticking up there like a wow. flagpole. And just, just terrible destruction everywhere with the, it really was a funny feeling to see the United States, so everything was perfect. I'll be darned. Do you remember when you got into Denver and homecoming and seeing your folks for the first time, what that yeah. what that was like to they, be they, home again? And they, I, they took me to Fort Logan. I get, and my dad my little sister came and got me out there to Fort Logan. It was really quite an experience. And then my dad... He, we went up to uh, Rocky Mountain National Park to, I uh, can't think of the name of it, there was a lodge up there where you could go fishing in Rocky Mountain National Park, Sprague's Lodge I think is what they called it. I don't know if Sprague's Lodge is still there, yeah. but my dad had a, a week, we, we went, my dad, my mother, my little sister were Went up there for a week right after I got back from. Oh, that must have been nice. Oh, jeez, that was really something. We went fishing every day, you know. And, uh, uh, it was it was in June, so it was kind of weather like this up there, but it was still pretty wonderful, you know. I'll bet. And then I I went to Camp Robinson and got out, and another. Buddy of mine 
that I'd gone to high school with. He'd been, he was a B-25 pilot over in the South Pacific, and he got discharged in December also. And he had a Mobley Ford Roadster, and he and I took a trip to New York City in that Mobley Ford. Wow. Oh, that had to be an adventure. And he, he was an officer. He had, he, uh, well, I took my uniform too because we could go, if you, if you uh, had a uniform, you could go stay in a YMCA for 50 cents a night or something. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And we, we, we took this trip. We were gone about a month. We went to Detroit and watched them make cars and, and uh, all over the place back there in the Model A Ford. Wow, wow. So, <laughs> so then I went back to school. At Aggies on the GI Bill, and that was pretty nice because uh, you know they paid for your tuition, yeah. and books, and gave you a certain amount of money to live on and stuff. Pretty nice. And then I, while I was up there, I got uh, I got acquainted with a guy who had a ranch up north of Fort Collins and he, he wanted to go in the uh, pulled Hereford registered cattle business and he had a son-in-law that was living on his ranch and uh, his son-in-law wasn't interested in the deal. So I went to work for him, and before I got up, before I graduated, from I, I was um, getting a degree in animal husbandry because I wanted to be a cattle buyer. But, you know, All that, right, yeah. That's one thing he had it, uh, like Armour and Swift and right. kind of, and they, If you you had a have a college degree in animal husbandry. So, but then I, I thought, you know, this was a, looked like a better deal to me. So I, I went in with this guy. Um, he made me, he formed a corporation. He was giving me stock in the corporation plus a little bit of salary. And uh, he had, uh, he owned a drugstore for a call. And he sold the drugstore. And when he was 46 years old, we I'd been working for him for about a year and a half, I guess. He had a heart attack and died. And they froze all his assets. And uh, his wife had some brothers down in Kearney, Nebraska, and they knew that there was a B-29 base in Kearney, Nebraska that had been built on really good farmland. And they poured these big concrete runways to land B-29s on. Then they leased, they leased the whole air base to the city of Kearney. And these guys, these brothers, uh, uh, this guy's wife, knew the guys running the uh, air base there. And so we took the cattle that we had up there at Fort Collins down to Kearney to the air base to pasture them on the cornstalk pasture that they were growing corn between the runways and stuff. And I went down there with them. And his wife wanted to sell out everything. So uh, I knew I was gonna, wasn't going to be able to do that anymore. And I came to see the head cattle buyer at the Denver Stockyards. And told him I was looking for a job. And he says, he took me over to the general manager and, and uh, said, yeah, well, 
I'm glad to have you come to work here. So when the one finished with that outfit down in Nebraska came and uh, the, the general manager at Armour had a, uh, a program where if you were going to be in the management part of the packing house, you had to work at different departments oh, sure. yeah. in the packing house. And I, when I first started there, I'd worked there before in summer vacations and stuff uh, at the feed lot. And so I knew some of the guys. And I thought they put me to grading sheep on the killing floor. The sheep grader was the last guy on the chain. The guy just ahead of the sheep grader, they dressed out a lamb. They had a lot legs on two hooks. They put both legs on one hook, tied them together, and they put a shroud on them so they cure smooth in the free in the cooler. And then the sheep grader take them off the hook and hang them on a scale and weigh them sort of on different scales that were going to the cooler according to weight ranges. That's what they called creating sheep was putting them in the right weight range. And um, so it was, a, it was a heck of a job being the last one. And if they, like I remember, 85 lambs an hour, you did it by yourself. They went up to 110 lambs an hour, you got a helper with you. But the guy, the general manager, the name was T.J. Tynan. He had a son named Ed Tynan that he wanted to be in the meatpacking business. So he sent Ed Tynan up to the kill floor to, for me to teach him how to grade lambs. Because I'd been there about six months and I was about ready to go to another department. And Ed Tynan worked there about a week. And he said, to heck with this, I'm not, I'm not going to be in the meatpacking business. So he quit. Upset his father when he quit a little bit. But he, he went into the automobile business and formed a company called Tynan Motors. And his Tynan... Tynan Motors are on cars all over Colorado. Yeah. You probably heard Hell of Tynan yeah. Motors. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And that was Ed Tynan. That was the general manager's son who wasn't going to work in the back of the house. <laughs> so he made more money than his dad did. Yeah. <laughs> Got more famous and everything. Well, then I, I went from the working inside the packing house to the hog department. They taught me how to be a hog buyer. And then they quit killing hogs in Denver. They, uh, so then they transferred me to the cattle buying department. And so I achieved an ambition when I went to school. Right, yeah. I got to be a cattle buyer. I was a cow, bought cows and bulls. I, I didn't uh, get to buy fat cattle, but we they we bought a lot of cattle up here in northern Colorado, and, and one of the buyers had to be uh, at the scale where they loaded them to weigh them to ship them to Denver, and they always did that on Sunday morning because uh, to get the cattle down there, start open up the kill on Monday. And usually I got stuck with coming up here to weigh the cattle. All, that's all I had to do. I had to drive up to Eaton or Alt or Greeley or someplace and, and be there, make sure they balance the scale and everything. So then they quit uh, 
Well, after they quit killing hogs, pretty soon they closed the big packing house in Denver. An armor bought a, an outfit. There's an outfit called K and B Packing Company, and they they had a smaller packing house, and armor bought that one. And after I, uh, uh, then I got married, and uh, I married a, a, a gal that was a school teacher in Denver, and uh, I decided that there wasn't much future in armor anymore because in order for me to get promoted, I would have to go to another market somewhere, and I'd have to leave Denver. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and things were changing there anyway. In, in fact, the, the hog deal, they used to buy hogs in, in uh, uh, Iowa and Illinois and Nebraska, put them on a the railroad, bring them to Denver, unload them and feed and water them, put them back on the railroad and take them out to California hmm. and butcher them out there. Then they started building refrigerated trucks and they would take produce from California, fruit and vegetables, and refrigerated trucks back east and they were bringing refrigerated trucks empty back to California. Oh, okay. So they decided they could butcher the hogs back where they were growing them, put them in a refrigerated truck, haul them out to California all dressed out, and they wouldn't have the death loss or the bruises or mm -hmm. all the problems they had. While they were deciding that, the manager of the stockyards in Denver build a new hog facility to unload hogs and water them and feed them in Denver. And while they were building that new hog facility, they were switching over. Oh boy. <laughs> they never did, they built a beautiful new hog facility and never used it. Hmm. Because by the time they got it finished, they'd already yeah. hauled the refrigerated carcasses out there. So a lot of the stuff I was in, like the horse-drawn field artillery, that went out of style right during World War II. They yeah. quit doing that. Yeah. And they had one mule pack outfit. Uh, but that was, I think that was the main thing that had live horses and mules and stuff. And then they quit killing hogs in Denver. Then eventually they closed all the packing houses in Denver. I uh, I started working. I had a brother that was a paint contractor, and I, I quit armor and went to work for him. And then I started I buy old houses and fix them up. And. I was doing that, and then my wife, uh, that was a school teacher, she died mm. when she was 55 years old, and we had three kids, and uh, then I got a couple years after she died, I ran into Diane. Got married to Diane, and we bought this little farm, and that's where I am today. <laughs> Very good. <So. laughs> wow. Well, it was an interesting uh, story here. Just a few questions here. We'll start to wind down the interview. Okay. Uh, uh, I guess the, my first question is: Is, is there anything that, that we didn't talk about, or I forgot to ask you about? Any stories that we've left out, just to kind of round out uh, uh, this interview that you can think of that you wanted to talk about? No, I, I like, like I was telling you at the start, I, I uh, never dreamed that I would even talk about it at right, all. Right, right. You know, so, um, and 
because even even now, since even like thinking that you wanted to talk to me and stuff, I would think of stuff and buddies I'd have, I have memories come back that I really don't like to have come back because uh, I'd almost forgotten about them. But I can mm. think of, what, should I tell you about this or should I tell sure. you about that? But, um, you know, it, how was that transition? We talked about your transition into the military. How was that transition going from the military and everything that you'd been through back in civilian life? Was it, was it, were you able to put all that stuff behind you and, yeah, and move yeah, on? I was, I did a beautiful job. I yeah. put it all behind me. I feel like, feel like I was born again. And up at, uh, up at uh, school, that was a, a you know, a lot of GIs, ex-GIs were going to school then, and they were all, all about the same way. Yeah, right. I had, when I was a freshman up here, I lived in a co-op house, and there were four of us in a, in a room, a study room we had. On the third floor of this house we, was our dormitory. And two guys slept in a double bed. They had a whole bunch of double beds up there on them. Uh, and uh, I had a, I had a Sears uh, Roba agricultural scholarship when I started up there, which was only fifty dollars, but it paid my tuition, and I had. This is before you went into the war. This is a yeah, this scholarship is, before. This is after I got out of high school. Okay. Okay. Before I went to school, I had this Sears Ag scholarship, and I had one hundred twenty-five dollars, and that's all it cost me to go to school up there the first year because I had I had a job working at a boarding house, and I worked for the school at the school farm for a little bit. There was a a lot of opportunities to work, and I worked in the beet harvest. Uh, somehow or other, I got by on $125 and then, and the, uh, um, um, I forget what I was going to, why I was telling you that, uh, uh, but going back to school there, with the GI Bill, I I still t did odd jobs and stuff around there, but it was really nice to have it all paid for. And they had a the 84th Infantry Division second annual reunion was in Denver, and there was a guy named Theodore Draper who was uh, in our division. And uh, Henry Kissinger, by the way, was in the 84th Division. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. But this Theodore Draper wrote a history of the 84th Division, but he was, he came to Denver to that second reunion. And uh, I wasn't married then. I was, and I, he was single too. And when he came, I, I had time to take him around up, like look, look out mountain and up to Fort Collins and stuff. And he wrote an article for the Saturday Evening Post. It was uh, the title of it was "There Are No GIs Anymore," and he wrote about what had happened at this convention in Denver, and, it, and he had a, he took a picture. He, he sent a photographer up there to Aggies and he took pictures of me doing different stuff, sitting in the classroom and stuff. And one picture that he put in the Saturday Evening Post was a bunch of us guys playing poker. We were smoking cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> Another guy was, uh, there, were, there were four guys that he had pictures of. 
but that was another interesting experience I had. To, uh, Ending up in the being in the Saturday evening post. post. I'll be darned. Uh, <laughs> so, I, I, you know, I try to look at all the good things that happened. Forget about all the other stuff. Yeah. Was, well, how do you that, think uh, that period of time, your war experience, how did did that change you in any way? Did it affect your life? Uh, play a role in your life? Or did, was it, did it not? It, was it just simply just a, a chapter in your life that you went through? How do you, how do you feel about that time well, period? It, it definitely played a role in my life. I mean, uh, I was, uh, uh, they, we had a chaplain, our company had a chaplain. All right. It might have been the whole battalion chaplain, I don't know. But we would have a church service uh, in the rest area. And I, I know he had a he had a flag it was a cross. And uh, it made me a, I would say the war made me a Christian because uh, I, f I, I figured, you know, that uh, there is a God, and even though you don't understand all the things that, that happens, how, how God would allow this or that to happen, there's always a good side to uh, everything. Yeah. So that probably had a big influence on me from a religious standpoint. Mm -hmm. So, I would say that is one impact it made on me. Also, appreciate going to school and uh, I, it was, I, I look on it as a great experience, even like this honor flight, it's, you know, something. It's hard to believe. I have a hard time believing that some of the good things that happened to me. And mm. one of the good things is that I was able to forget all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. And, uh, so you never felt like you had it. through the disappointments, like all the buddies I had, the great, great, really talented guys that got killed mm. when they were 18 or 19 years old. You know, it's a real tragedy in a way. When you see all the bad people that are roaming around doing stuff, you know, and you think, well, how, how does this happen that these great guys got killed real young and yeah. these other guys getting away with what they're getting away with? Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but no, it didn't affect, I, I had, I think in our family we have some kind of a, a gene problem with alcohol because we've had my cousin that was my age that was in Spokane whose dad was a cattle buyer, he he went he became a pilot and uh, he got killed in a plane crash right after World War Two ended. He he got married, he'd been married for a couple months and then their plane crashed. He was still in the Air Force. Mm. And my younger brother was an alcoholic. He died when he was 47 years old. And uh, then I have my my dad's oldest brother uh, was a, a sailor, and he he was in World War One, and he got off the ship he was on in Australia and met some gal and married her, and he stayed in Australia. And they had three boys, and uh, one of them was a veterinarian, and he came over to the United States, and I got a, I got acquainted with him, and Diane and I went to Australia to see him, and he was an alcoholic. He, all those three boys over there in Australia. 
the oldest two died of cirrhosis of the liver from drinking, and the youngest was Bob was a veterinarian. He had a heart attack, but he drank all the time. Uh, how do you think you managed to escape that? Particularly after all that you'd been through, you think you could easily have succumbed to that with uh, your experiences. How do you? What do you credit? With? I I don't. You know, made me sick most of the time. Yeah. Uh, Okay. I, I I didn't have it. Uh, I I like to drink beer and yeah. do all that stuff, but I couldn't do it like those those guys did. Yeah. You know. Uh -huh. And why they did it, I don't know. My younger brother was in the navy. You know, got tattooed. He's married several times, and it's just a hell raising all the time. Yeah. He was gonna lead us short faster than he did. Yeah. Uh -huh. So um, hmm. I I don't know what and then and I have some nephews that are alcoholics. So hmm. I I figure that that's there's some kind of hereditary thing here with the, Yeah, yeah. You know? Hmm. And I escaped that, that's another thing I'm really grateful for. Uh, I, I have just a whole bunch of stuff to be thankful for. So, mm. and, and I, uh, I saw, <coughs> one thing I was going to tell you was one of the most important things. The Germans had started out with 10,000 political prisoners that they didn't want to, the Russians to find out that they had and so they were walking them west and they didn't feed them and if they fell they would either shoot them or just leave them lie there and they, Ended up with, when they got to this little place in Germany with 2,000 left out of the 10,000. And there was a great big stone barn, had four great big doors on it. And they put oil and gas, poured it on the floor and covered it with straw. And they put these 2,000 people in there and they had tanks with machine guns at each door and they threw incendiary grenades in on the barn, set the whole thing on a big fire and the ones that tried to get out they machine gunned them and there was about a half a dozen of them that fell in the doorway and then dead bodies fell on top of them and after the fire went out the Germans uh, went around hollering anybody need any help if anybody said they need some help they shot them. Well uh, the reason they had done that was the Allied forces were closing in on them from the west and and uh, so they, uh, when they, they got there, of course the Germans had taken off that had done that, but they, they had a bulldozer there and they were, they dug a great big trench, like, it's like a pit silo, and they were bulldozing bodies in there when the Americans got there, they took off. Well, that, General, the commander of the army that discovered that, uh, they had the German civilians in this little village where they they had done that. The women, the kids, the old men, and everything. They had them up there dragging all those bodies out and and uh, lines, and he wanted everybody. 
every outfit there to send somebody there to witness that, come back and tell their outfit what they saw and how, how terrible that was. And they sent me to see that. Oh, jeez. And it was, it was really something because their, their bodies, their legs and their arms were just skin and bones and, and their bloated midsections of the ones that were, there were uh, hands burned off against the walls of the barn. Mm. And oh, it's just terrible. But there was, there was, a, but there were these six survivors that uh, were able to tell the story mm. of the 10,000 to start with and what happened to them all, all along the way. And so that this American, Army General wanted everybody to, like I went back to our company to tell them what I had seen and that they were to ride home and tell their folks how terrible the Germans were. Wow. And it was, that, that, probably more than anything else seeing that made me realize how important it was that the United States had gone to war, got rid of Hitler and the Nazis, you know. Yeah, yeah. How terrible, how one human being could do that to another human yeah. being is beyond my imagination. Oh, it's, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a terrible thing. Wow, wow. They actually had, you know, and they, you know, they did that with the Jewish people. They, killed millions of them. Right. Yeah. Have you ever had a chance to go back to Europe since, uh, you know, to revisit any of the places you'd been, Walt? Well, Leo and me, his name was Leo Schleifer. They, they came over here. And uh, while they were here, uh, one of the I, we own shares in this ditch, and part of the responsibility is I have to clean the ditch from Road 3 back to my property line. And we had torn down a chicken house, and I had a pile of two befores and, and different boards with nails in them and stuff. So while Leo was here, I had some things I had to do a couple days. And one day I had him help me clean the ditch. And it was a hot day and it was a dirty job and everything. And he, but he worked all day. And then one day I had to be gone. I had him, gave him a crowbar and a hammer and had him pull the nails on those two befores. And the rest of the time we spent having fun with him. But then, A couple of years after they were here, they invited us to come to Holland. So Diane and I went over to Holland. And they met us at the Amsterdam airport. And they lived clear up in the end of Holland. It was close to Belgium and Germany where we had stayed. Right. They still lived in the house that we'd stayed with them. And they, they took us up there. And he had. After he got out of high school, he joined the Dutch Navy, and he was on a ship, and the guy that had charge of all the food service on the ship had a heart attack and died, so they made Leo with the charge of all that. He learned how to cook and manage a kitchen and everything. So when he got out of the Navy, he opened up a bar and a restaurant, and he did so well at that that he started a school how to run a bar and a restaurant. And he was a wealthy guy. When we got over there to their house, they had hired people that did all their yard work oh. and stuff. And here he was. <laughs> I, I felt kind of bad about that. Yeah. Cause, uh, and then uh, he took us all around. There's a cemetery in Holland, 
It's a World War II cemetery called the Margraten Cemetery. It's in Holland. And most of the, or a lot of the 84th Division casualties are buried there. Oh, wow. And they have a big, they have a great big red and white rail splitter patch thing on the cemetery. He took us there and uh, he, he took us, we went, we went to the church where this buddy of mine that I was in high school with, he was, when he got captured, they were in the basement of this church and they had a, 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 a some medical aid men there and they had wounded Germans and wounded Americans in the basement there when the Germans captured the church and they took they took all the soldiers including my buddy prisoner and took him to a prison camp but they left the aid men medical aid men to take care of the wounded there and at one of the rail splitter conventions there was a big table there were ten guys sitting around and I was sitting next to a guy and Bill Ingram was the prisoner guy was over at the other end of the table. And this guy was telling me, he says, you know, uh, I was an aid man. And he said, we were in a church. And the Germans took over the church. And they captured all the guys, but they left me there to take care of these people. So I didn't get captured. I said, you got to be kidding. I said, that guy sitting over there was one of the guys that was in the church. He says, you've got to be kidding. And I said, no, go around there. I hollered at Bill and I said, you got to talk to this guy. And sure, this, this was a guy, it, I've had experiences yeah. like that that yeah. are unbelievable. I'll be doing it. Uh, you know? Did you ever, uh, when you were overseas, ever run into anybody from home or anybody you knew just by chance? Uh, Yep, we were when we were on the Elbe River. Oh, I was uh, I know what I was going to tell you. There, we were living in this uh, uh, co-op house, and there were four guys in the studying together. And one of the guys was a gunner in a B-17. And he got killed. One of the other guys was a pilot over in the South Pacific, and he got shot down. And he he had a, a guy flying with him who watched him, and he came out and inflated his life raft and everything, got in the life raft, and then this guy went back to their base, and they came out to try to find him, and they never did find him. So somehow or other he got lost at sea. The guy that was the gunner is a guy from Gypsum. Uh, so they shot the wing off his airplane and the airplane was spinning around on one wing. Centrifugal force held the guys in there so they couldn't yeah. eject out of the airplane. The front end of the airplane broke off and the pilot and the navigator and flight engineer or somebody, the three guys in the front of that B-17 got tossed out into the air, pulled their parachutes, came down and, and got captured. They were prisoners of war. But when they got back to the States, they came to the pilot, came to see different members of his crew and this one buddy of mine, his he had a sister who lived in Denver and he came and told the guy's sister what happened to the rest of them, that they got tossed out into the air and were prisoners and all that. Then one summer I, I, I went to see the sister too and she told me the story about how I got killed. I was looking for a job and I w w went up to Granby and got a job at, 
on the Grammy Dam. They were building the Grammy Dam for the Colorado Big Thompson thing there. Mm -hmm. And I uh, was in, they had barracks, and all the guys working there, you'd work all day, and then they had a mess hall, and you sleep in the barracks. And I was laying there in my bunk, and I heard this guy saying, I had a, I had a son that was in the Air Force, and he was a gunner on a B-17, and he said, they shot the wing off the airplane, the airplane spinning down, and it was this Stanley Calhoun was the name of this buddy of mine. And this his dad was a laborer on the Granby Dam wow. telling these guys about his son. I I I couldn't believe it. I went over and I, t I, t I asked the guy, is your name Calhoun? And he said, Yeah. And, I, and then I told him that I would live with his Son, yeah, wasn't that something? Yeah, I'll be that another. Yeah. Thing. So half of, half of the guys in that co-op were killed. Two out of four of you. Two out. Yeah, and the uh, other guy, uh, I don't remember. Hmm. I lost track of him somehow, yeah. but the, the one guy was a fighter pilot, lost at sea, and yeah. Stan uh, Calhoun was the uh, the gunner. And you say, did I see anybody over there? Well, there was a guy, his name was Ivan Porter, and he was a he was a senior when I was a freshman. And he was a field artillery officer. And uh, we had, on the bank of the Elk River, uh, Elk River, there was a great big dike. And we had foxholes dug in the side of that dike so we could look out over the old river. And I was in the foxhole with a guy. In to the foxhole comes Ivan Porter. He was a captain in the field artillery and they were assigned to the 84th Division. And he was look, looking down there and out of out of all the whole big world. He jumps in he your fox. <laughs> so uh, I saw him over in Germany and then I I came back here to school and he was working at CSU. So I got acquainted with him and his wife and stuff and now he's since passed away. Yeah, uh, but uh, I, that's one guy I saw. can't remember what. I saw another guy when I was going to school in Drexel. And he was a student up in, and he was in the service too. And he found out I was going to school and I saw him. Hmm. So, um, I, was, I was really lucky that way. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Those are the things I've thought about most since start talking to guys like you. Yeah. You know, uh, the other terrible things I, it, like if you, if you would see a real bad automobile accident, see somebody torn in half, you'd, you'd try to forget it. Oh, them, you bet. Oh, sure. You can't you describe it to Oh, that's, that's understandable, and it's a good thing that you're able to. They're able to, to, yeah. to, to block those out. I can yeah. Blank, yeah. I, I blank yeah. this stuff off. Of the, mm. And Diane, I never, I, I really never dreamed that I would ever be back to the United States, because we, we just, the, the odds were too far against right. you. Yeah, you bet. Yeah. Uh, so mm. try to to be as comfortable as as we could. Yeah. Smoke as many cigarettes as we could. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Sam, we'll start to wind. We'll wind down this interview. Actually, is there any statement uh, that you'd like to make to those that will watch us to to kind of round out and close off this interview, or or not? Or do you have one? 
Well, a closing I, statement you know, of any choice. I, I really think it's great that um, somebody like you would devote some time to doing this, you know. Uh, whether anybody else would ever be interested in it or not, uh, you know, it would make me wonder. But I have, I enjoyed reading that, that guy over in Glenwood Springs. I wanted to meet him because he, he had real talent to write about mm -hmm. each one of those guys, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Larry, Larry Moses is, uh, you know, Pretty impressed with him. He did a lot of work writing that book, and and uh, came to see us. And I would say that it's it's a good feeling to know there are guys like you, and guys like the Honor Flight that are putting all that effort into uh, you know being nice to guys like me. Well, I can't speak for them, but for myself, it's. My way, of, my small way of saying thank you for what you did. So, but uh, well, we'll close her off then. I, uh, Sam, I want to thank you for uh, for sitting around and telling your story today. But more importantly, I want to thank you for your service to our country. It's, it's amazing. Which explain what it is? Well, all the stuff. Anything you want to explain in this? This is a wonderful okay. collection. This is a this is a presidential unit set. A citation for our. Regiment. Uh, this is a shoulder patch for the ASTP program. This is our division insignia. This is a combat infantry badge, which is the most thing I'm most proud of. Oh, sure, that's a that's a high honor to, to yeah, accomplish this that. This is a bronze star. This is a purple heart. This is a good conduct medal. This American Victory Medal. It's a European theater with three battle stars for the Rhineland and the Ardennes and Central Europe. And I don't. This is American Victory or something. This is my overseas bars on my uniform. My dog tags. This is a a. Uh, German Army uniform sign and an SS identification, and this is a picture of I Company. Now, this SS, this is what you t took off the SS officer. These this is what I took off the SS officer. Okay. Yeah. And uh, that's a wonderful display. Where, where's my ruptured duck? And that, that's this is a. What they give you when you get an honorable discharge. A ruptured duck is what it's called. And so.